I invite you to take your Bibles with me now and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. This is the last chapter of the book. And we're just going to read over the Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ from verses 16 to 20. And when you get there, would you rise out of reverence for God's holy word? Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 16. Hear the word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the sufficient word of God. You may be seated. This morning we are continuing our little series on the doctrine of the Trinity. We said last week that it's very important for a Christian to have a solid understanding of the triune God that we worship, love, and adore because he is the object of our faith. On the one hand, we don't want to have the attitude that says, I love God, but I don't really care about learning about the Trinity. Because that would just be like a man saying, I love my wife, but I don't really care about learning anything about her. No, if you love someone, you are going to want to learn about who they are. But on the other hand, we don't ha want to have an insatiable curiosity that goes beyond what God has revealed about himself. There are some things that God has left in mystery beyond our ability to comprehend. And while we may not find that very satisfying, we must trust that God has his reasons for this, and we leave those reasons to him. So those are the two extremes we want to avoid, saying, oh, I don't really care, or I care too much, and I'm too curious. Whenever we seek to go beyond what God has revealed, that's when we begin to get into trouble. God does not reveal everything to us in order to humble us and keep us humble as we look up at him in awe and adoration. And we said last week that the biblical doctrine of the Trinity rests upon three pillars. And can you remember what those three pillars are? Well, the first one is God is one being. The second one that we're going to look at today is um, that there are three divine persons. And the third one is that each divine person is fully God. And so last week, we looked at the first pillar together. God is one being. That there's only one God. And we saw how both the Old and New Testaments affirm this immovable truth. That God is one being, and there is no one else besides him. And we also associated a key word with that first pillar. It's the key word, being. Because when we say that God is one, we mean that he is one simple being or one essence. That in his essence, God is just one being. And today we're going to see why we must use very particular language and precise vocabulary. Because when we begin to use different words, that's when things begin to go off the rails. And so this morning, I'm also going to associate a Bible verse with pillar number one. And that Bible verse is Mark chapter 12, verse 29. It's a special verse because it's a two-for-one kind of deal. In this verse, the Lord Jesus is quoting the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And he's declaring that it is part of the greatest commandment in all of the law of God. And the Shema is the Jewish confession of faith, which says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so there directly we see that Scripture and the Lord Jesus declare the oneness of God. 
And so as Christians, there is no higher authority for us than the words of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. And so here in Mark 12, 29, our Lord and Master is affirming the Jewish Shema here. So we have in one verse both the Old and New Testaments declaring this truth of God's oneness. And so the first pillar is that God is one being. That's what monotheism is, one being of God. And the key word to associate with this first pillar is the word being. And the key verse is Mark 12, 29. Now when we say that God is one being, it's the same thing as saying that there is only one Yahweh. Yahweh is God's personal name. In older Bibles, God's name is Jehovah. Uh, but it's a little bit more accurate to say Yahweh. This was the name that was revealed to Moses at the burning bush. And when Moses asked what he should say if the people ask him who is sending him, God tells him that his name is I am who I am. He, tell, he says, tell them I am has sent me to you. Yahweh means I am, and this is the name of God. And so we say that God is one being whose name is Yahweh. And this morning we're moving on to the second pillar today, that there are three distinct divine persons. And here the key word is persons. So one being, three persons. And when we say that the New Testament reveals that God is three divine persons, it's like we're saying that the New Testament says that the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, and the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. All three divine persons harmoniously share in the name Yahweh. And so when we use the divine name, Yahweh or Jehovah, in light of what has been revealed in the New Testament, it is the name of the triune God. And so the, so the God who revealed his name to Moses at the burning bush was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Yahweh, I am. Now let's look at a couple of passages in Scripture where we see these three persons being mentioned. So as we saw at the end of Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 28, we see Jesus saying this, this thing to his, his 11 disciples there. It's called the Great Commission. But notice what he says there once again. He says to them, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. And it's easy just to, to read that and pass over that without thinking very deeply about it. But what do we notice about that statement? Jesus says there is one name, singular, but there are three persons being talked about here. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? One name, three persons in view. Because we would normally expect Jesus to use the plural here. We would expect him to say, baptizing them in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what Jesus says here, is it? He says it's one name. Or, on the other hand, we would expect Jesus to talk about three separate names, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what Jesus is declaring either. He says that there is one name, which we have seen as Yahweh, which is possessed by the Father and the Son and by the Holy Spirit. One name, three persons. The Father is Yahweh I am, the Son is Yahweh I am, and the Spirit is Yahweh I am. Then if you do have your Bibles open, you can flip over in the book of Matthew to chapter 3. In the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel, we see this familiar scene of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. And so in verses 16 to 17, it says there, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And so here we see the Son is being baptized, the Holy Spirit is descending in the form of a dove, and it's the Father who is speaking from heaven. So all three persons are shown to be distinct here, but in perfect harmony of will and purpose. And we have other statements in the New Testament that refer to the three persons. 
For instance, in the last verse of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul leaves the believers with this blessing. He says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That is a Trinitarian blessing. Or take Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6 as an example. Here the Apostle Paul writes, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There again we see each member of the triune God mentioned there. Or even John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. This is Jesus talking, and he says, When the Spirit of truth comes... That's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take all that is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we notice even there in Jesus' words, we have the spirit of truth, we have Jesus talking about himself, and then he also refers to the Father. We see all three persons there. So these are just a few examples of where we see the three divine persons referred to all together in the same spot. There are plenty of other examples where we can see two together, whether the Father and the Son, or maybe the Son and the Spirit, or the Father and the Spirit. And there are even other examples where we see each of the persons revealed to be God, where the Father is divine, the Son is divine, and the Holy Spirit is divine. Now, of course, this is the New Testament. Well, what about the Old Testament? Does the Old Testament teach the triune nature of God as well? Well, many critics of the Christian faith, including Jewish people and Muslims, they argue that the Trinity is not taught in the Old Testament, and that's why they reject it. But are they right? Is it true that the Old Testament does not teach or reveal the Trinity at all? Well, let us clearly understand something. Let us realize that the fullness of the triune nature of God came in the revelation of Jesus Christ. When God the Son stepped out of heaven and joined humanity to himself, becoming the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth, the promised Messiah. Because it was actually Jesus who revealed God's triune nature in his incarnation. And this is why it is primarily the New Testament that reveals the deity of Christ as well as the personality of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Messiah seemed to be just a great king from the line of David. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit seemed to be just an impersonal force as a power emanating from God. But in the coming of Jesus Christ, it is revealed that the Messiah is actually the divine Son of God. And it's also revealed that the Holy Spirit is not a force or divine power, but rather he is a distinct divine person alongside the Father and the Son. And so in the Old Testament, we do not see explicit revelation of God's triune nature. But what we do see is we see hints and glimpses and foreshadowings that make sense when we go back and read the Old Testament in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we can actually go back to the very beginning, to the very first few verses of the Bible, where Genesis 1-1 opens the Bible by saying this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And through New Testament revelation, we understand that all three persons of the triune God were active in creation. For in Genesis 1 verse 2, we see the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. He is hovering over the face of the waters. And then in verse 3, we see God the Father speaking light into existence. And then according to John chapter 1, the creative word that God spoke was actually God the Son participating in creation. And then we could move on from there to Genesis chapter 2 on the sixth day of creation. When God created the first man, he said, let us make man in our own image. In chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fall into sin, God says, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And then in chapter 11, with the Tower of Babel, God says, let us go down and confuse their languages. 
And as Christians, we read these verses, and we know that they are not specifically revealing the triune nature of God here, but they are offering a glimpse into the mystery that God is both singular and plural simultaneously. We consider it appropriate to see the triune God speaking in these verses when he says, let us do such and such. Here are just a couple of other examples from the Old Testament. We read uh, this morning in the, um, in the scripture reading, Genesis 19. And you might have noticed this, you might have uh, not noticed this, but in verse 24 of that chapter, in describing the destruction of the wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, did you catch that it says, then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And so this means that Yahweh, who had just been talking to Abraham, he rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven. Well, we might scratch our heads at that. Well, how can there be a Yahweh on earth and a Yahweh in heaven at the same time? This does not reveal the Trinity, but it does make sense in light of the Trinity. And in Psalm 110, verse 1, King David, speaking prophetically in the Holy Spirit, declares this. He said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And it was Jesus himself who points out to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the experts of the law who are trying to trap him that there are two lords in this verse. There's Yahweh and there's the Messiah. Lord and Lord, and yet the Messiah is David's Lord. He says, my Lord. He's not David's descendant, and this is pointing to the Messiah's preexistence and divinity. And again, in the book of Psalms, verse 40, uh, chapter 45, verse 6, the Messiah is even addressed as God. It says there, your throne, O God, talking about the Messiah, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. And in Daniel chapter 7, the Messiah is depicted as the Son of Man, entering into the presence of the Ancient of Days. And he receives an eternal kingdom, and he receives service and worship from the peoples and the nations. And again, in Isaiah chapter 9, among the titles for the Messiah, he is called Mighty God and Everlasting Father. And taking all of these examples from the Old Testament together, we see that even in the Old Testament, the Messiah is somehow divine while being distinct from God. And finally, we may point to the fact that many times in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord speaks as Yahweh in the place of Yahweh. And there seems to be a kind of suggestion that the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh while being distinct from Yahweh at the same time. And Christians from very ancient times, at least from the time of Justin Martyr, in 150 AD, have long recognized that the angel of the Lord is God the Son in his pre-incarnate state. And so we ask again, does the Old Testament teach or reveal the Trinity? Well, no, it does not directly teach or reveal the divine mystery, but it does reveal glimpses that make sense in light of the full revelation of the New Testament. And the New Testament brings the full revelation that there are three divine persons. And that is our second pillar. And the key word that we are associating with this second pillar is the word person. And this is a very carefully chosen word that Orthodox Trinitarian Christians have used historically. And so we cannot just use any old word without running into trouble and difficulty. And so if anyone ever tells you that they don't believe that God is three persons, but three other things, and they use a different word, then your ears should probably perk up that something is a little off here. For example, if someone tells you that he doesn't like the term person, but prefers the term manifestation, that God is three manifestations, then really alarm bells ought to be sounding in your head. But why? Why is that wrong to use the term manifestation instead of person? That makes sense, doesn't it? That God manifests himself as Father and then as Son and then as Holy Spirit. What's wrong with that? Well, actually, everything is wrong with that. 
That's the equivalent of saying that God is like using two hand puppets, the one named Jesus and one named the Holy Spirit. And there's no real difference between any one of them. And so when we say that God is one being, while well, he is also three divine persons, we're actually using very precise language here. From the revelation of Scripture, we have learned that God is actually one being and three persons. And we could only know this if God revealed himself in this way. Because there's nothing else in all the created universe that we can point to for comparison. Being refers to what a thing is. Person refers to who an individual is. And so when we talk about the triune God, we are saying that there is one what and there are three who's. I am Jake Stewart. I am one being and I am one person. I am one what and I am one who. I exist in a one-to-one -one relationship between being and person. But God is not like me. God does not exist in a one-to-one being-person nature. He exists in a one-to-three being-person nature. God is one what, and he is three who's. And this is why we have such a hard time trying to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And that's why smoke begins to come out of our ears when we think about it. Because we want to compare God with us. With our one-to-one -one nature. But you know what? We are created in the image of God. God is not a copy of us. And at the end of the day, we may still be wondering, how can this be? How can God be one and three at the same time? Well, you know, we could understand it if it was either or. Either God is one being or he is three persons. We would understand that. We can understand how one thing is one thing and three things are three things. That's easy to understand. But what we can't understand is how something can be both one and three at the very same time. It's beyond our understanding to comprehend that God is both and. God is both one being and he is three persons. We cannot understand this by making a comparison with any created thing, for God is completely unique. We can only understand if God reveals it to us as we trust in the revelation of his word. There is one God who is the one Yahweh, and the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, and the Holy Spirit is Yahweh, each fully deserving of our worship and adoration. So the second pillar upon which the doctrine of the Trinity rests is that there are three distinct divine persons. The key word to associate with this pillar is the word person. And the key verse we can connect with this pillar is the one we started with at the beginning, Matthew 28, verse 19, from the Great Commission, where we see one name shared by three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But let's close this morning by asking once again, why does this matter? Why does it matter? So what? One very big reason is that our salvation depends upon it. If we have a wrong view of who God is, then we are placing our faith in a false God. And a false God cannot save us. True faith must be placed in the true and living God, who is one being and three persons. Another big reason is if, the, if God is not three distinct divine persons, then the gospel is weakened to the point where it, it really no longer even matters anymore. If God did not hang upon the cross of Calvary, then the cross is meaningless and so is the resurrection. A created being, an angel, cannot purchase eternal redemption. And if God the Holy Spirit does not indwell us, binding us together with the Father and the Son in spiritual union, then it's, and if it's more of an impersonal force or divine energy, then we really have no real personal relationship with God. 
This wonderful God, whose name is Yahweh, was well pleased to accomplish eternal salvation for us through the roles of the three persons harmoniously working together. The Father has planned redemption. The Son purchased redemption upon the cross. And the Holy Spirit is presently applying redemption in the people of God. And what a comfort it is to know that God did not do this through created intermediaries, but he acted personally and directly. The plan was divine. The redemption on the cross was divine. And the application is divine. God personally planned it out. He personally accomplished it. And he is personally seeing it through. We are not trusting in created beings like angels, as if one of them went to the cross for our sin. We are not trusting in an impersonal force to indwell us and sanctify us to prepare us for eternal life. We are not placing our hope of eternal life in some exalted angel and some divine energy. No. Our certain and sure expectation of eternal life is placed in the eternal Father, the eternal Son, and the eternal Spirit, who are one being, the God whom we love, worship, and adore. Let us pray. Father God, we know that when we come to these deep doctrines to study what you have revealed about yourself, that it is often very difficult for us to understand and and very wise and learned people have spent their entire lives trying to articulate what this mystery is. But Father, we should not throw up our hands in despair or we should not say, oh, I just don't care anymore. Because Father, if you have revealed these truths in your word, then it is worth our struggle to to wrestle with these things and do our best to understand as much as you have revealed about yourself, but to go no farther. And so we see in your revealed word that you are one being, you are one God. You are the only God who exists and there is no other. And yet at the same time, you have revealed yourself as three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that when we worship the triune God, we worship Father, Son, and Spirit equally. For all three are worthy of our adoration. And so, Father, I pray that this is not something that we would run away from or turn away from or or turn our nose up at, Father. Because this is a revelation of who you are. And if we love you, we will desire to understand how you have revealed yourself to be. We will want to love you. We want to love the doctrine of the Trinity. Because it means that you, the living God, was personally active in our redemption. The Father planned it. The Son accomplished it. The Spirit applies it. And for that we say thank you, triune God, for you have accomplished our eternal salvation, not depending on anyone outside of yourself, on no created being, but you alone have done it, and therefore you alone deserves all the glory forever and ever. And so by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray, amen.